So we heard from David, we heard from Claire, we heard from Andy, we heard from Quinn about all these things that are coming in the future and it's going to be grand and wonderful and we're all going to live fulfilled lives. But in the meantime, what are the challenges, the real challenges that you see as experts in this field to be able to adopt this, this new urban mobility transportation nirvana, if we will? I'll, I'll start with David and we'll go this way. So Tom, yeah, thanks. I think the challenges are on a couple of fronts, but to, to be very concrete, the first one is uh, around what USDOT has tried to issue uh, last September, uh, and has really started the guidance process on what regulation is required. And in our response, we really said, you know, uh, low speed environments probably are more, um, uh, capable and uh, and adapting and rolling out highly automated vehicles um, in in the world, but so, so that that implies cities versus highway first. Right, I, I think urban, and that's the point of urban transportation. So I, I think the regulatory environment, and we've already seen um, leaders emerge, but some leaders like California have had to revise because technology leapfrogged their regulation. Uh, so I think. Uh, Having a very effective and close collaboration between uh, manufacturers and technology providers and uh, regulatory agencies at both the federal and the state and local levels is, is critical to allowing this to happen over Because gotcha. the technology is here, right? So that, right. that beautiful video that you guys showed and you're doing it in Las Vegas right now. Right? First, uh, congratulations so, to them on that. So the, the government framework is important. So what do you think, Claire? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I definitely agree. And I think regulation and infrastructure keeping up. But also, from our side, I think a really important thing is thinking about how people interact with these machines. We're creating this incredible technology, manufacturing incredible things. And it's really important that we understand the way people will want to interact with those. So you know, when I'm getting in an autonomous vehicle and I want to speak, because that's what I do, that's what I, I'm a human, I like to talk. And thinking about the way people are going to in interact with these machines from the beginning, because otherwise we're going to create amazing technologies, beautiful cars, and people are not going to trust them. They're not going to enjoy riding in them. They're not going to enjoy moving around the city. And I think that's a really key part, is think about the people at the beginning when you're designing these systems. Right. What about you, Andy? Well, I'd have to agree with both David and Claire in that, in that regulatory issues are a real have been a real sticking point for a while. Although, you know, this is the reason that Navia first approached private sites because there were no regulations in for a private, you know, industrial site. You could put you could put these things on there right away, these vehicles on there right away. We're now seeing in the United States some changes through uh, the, uh, the DOT, but also local and state regulations are changing and being more progressive about it, especially in those states I mentioned earlier, like Florida and Nevada and California. And, um, and Michigan, a few others. So in those states, I mean, I, I think that the, you know, our applications of low speed, you know, first and last mile technologies are, are, are moving more rapidly and you'll see them there first. From the social adoption point, you know, I, I worry about, you know, not only the people who are gonna be, the ridership who's gonna be taking these, but also the, the other people who might be impacted by them, you know, because I, I think there's some fear around that it's gonna take jobs away. I think jobs are gonna, are gonna evolve and change and, and be right. different. And so it's, uh, it's gonna be a, an interesting uh, future. And, and then, so let's finish up on this question with Quinn, and then I got one for you to start off. Yeah, so I love regulatory issues. Uh, if without regulatory issues, uh, my business doesn't exist. Um, so, so startup companies happen to, to play in most cases in regulatory gray areas, right? So think about, think about Uber. Is it legal or illegal to electronically hail a ride? Mm -hmm. Think about Tesla. Is it illegal or legal to sell your own vehicles? Um, are, you, are you enabling subsidies to Tesla for, you know, California's uh, carb, uh, carb emission subsidies or not, right? And you think about a lot of other startup companies, they're all enabled by the regulatory gray areas, right? Mm -hmm. And so I view them not as a, not so much of a challenge as, as an opportunity because startups typically aren't held to the same kind of standard of compliance with respect to regulations as large corporations are. Right, right. So, so let me follow up with that and say, so all of your presentations, again, focused on this wonderful future as it will be, but from, a, from an innovation perspective, the core is self-driving cars. Cars are going to be able to drive themselves. There's a lot of technology that goes into how to do that. What are the innovations that you see that are critical beyond the vehicle that need to have 
that need to be invented, that maybe aren't invented yet, or that great companies are working on. And could you guys talk about that a little bit? Mm -hmm. I'll start with Quinn. Sure. Uh, so if you look at the majority of our portfolio, it's actually outside the vehicle. Of those, of those five companies that I, that I showed up there, there's only one that actually sells something that goes into a vehicle, software that goes into a vehicle in, in deep scales case. So thinking about how do you, how do you buy these things? How do, you, how do you sell them? How do you finance them? How do you insure them, park them, repair them, share them? All of those are services that we, we would call decoupled uh, from an automaker's or, or truck maker's uh, supply chain. And oftentimes that means that they, they tend to be software-oriented uh, companies. Ha so happens that software-oriented companies need less capital to scale and can more easily test out uh, their, their solution uh, without having to wait, let's say, five years to get built into uh, a vehicle OEM's uh, platform and you know, multiple funding rounds and tens of millions of dollars. Excellent. I think there's an interesting evolution in the business model too. I mean, it's going to surround. It's going to, you know, we sell vehicles right now, but we're also, you know, we're also in the business of discussing how, what, what do we do with the data? We're collecting an enormous amount of data, which is valuable to a lot of people. And, and in the future, is that is that data so valuable that the cost of riding on a shuttle is free because the ridership doesn't, you know, it's 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 just in the noise. And if right. we make it free, we're still gaining the data piece, and we're getting data about not only the the, the roads and everything around us, but also about the ridership. So. I think it's an interesting it's an interesting time and in how we monetize these these technologies. Very good. Do you, do you have a comment yeah, on that, Claire? Because I have I mean, a question for you. I think. Oh well, go ahead. Go, go <laughs> to the next question. So so um, so what's happening? Is, if you think about urban transportation, you know, as, as Americans, and not everybody, you know, is, is an American that, that's here. But you know, you you tend to look at this evolving world through the lens of what you're used to in your community, but. It, is it true that the, this urban transportation transformation that's going to happen is actually going to occur outside of the U.S. before us? What do you think about that topic? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question because actually, you know, we're in a bubble here and we're working with these exciting technologies on roads that exist and with infrastructure in, uh, that exists in a, in a lot of ways. But you think most people in the world who live in cities don't live in developed countries. So you think about Nairobi. Nairobi is a city f teeming with people who are moving around. And some of them are moving around these days in smart rickshaws. Right. And so it's really important that we're thinking about the rest of the world when we're creating these technologies. And I know Ali, for example, is, is really interested, you, the team there are really interested in accessibility. And I think we need to think outside of, we're not just creating systems that work in the US, in DC, in New York, in Stuttgart. We're thinking about systems that need to work for the world and particularly in developing countries where you've got huge urban sprawl, people more and more moving into cities. That's where the future of urban mobility really matters and we need to create technologies that account for that and allow innovation to explode in those areas as well. Fantastic. And go ahead, David. Add, um, so I think a combination of the last two questions you asked from, from our perspective, right? Local motors uh, came into existence really focusing on two things. How do we um, maximize uh, resources locally to be able to make complex systems, so make big things in small places, mm -hmm. right? A and then the second part, which touches the urban transportation piece, um, in a lot of these emerging countries or less developed countries, um, Accessibility to, mobi uh, to, to mobility is really lacking from in public transport, but then even from a uh, consumer transport perspective, right? And, and that's really a safety issue. Uh, and so our focus as, as local motors is being able to uh, enable local municipalities, local organizations to create uh, resource efficient based transportation solutions mm -hmm. that meet local requirements and that are safe. Okay. and sustainable products. And so we try to bring that together in, from a business model. In, in the case of Ali, it happens to be a first last mile solution, but we've also created other vehicles that address other requirements. So let me ask, uh, we probably have time for one more question, uh, sadly, but uh, time's gone by so quickly. But if, if I'm an auto executive and I see the coming future of mobility, two part question for each of you, am I fearful or excited? And two, what do I need to take away from this panel to put in my brain to think, as I'm thinking strategy, and I'm thinking how we navigate and look around corners, what do I need to be aware of that maybe I'm not thinking about because I'm a car guy and I'm not an urban guy? 
What, what do you think? I'll let you and, and somebody can jump in there to, uh, at the start, I think. Yeah, I can go. <clears throat> I'd, I'd probably be both. Um, and there's, there is some fear, but there's also a lot of, a lot of excitement. Um, I, would, I would think that startup companies are, are great at innovating. Uh, they're nimble, they're frugal, but they suck at scaling. Uh, startup companies do not scale like corporations uh, do, right? And they don't have access to existing customer channels. So if I'm, if I'm an automotive exec and I'm thinking, hey, I've got, I've got scalability, I've been scaling for years, I have plenty of existing customers, if I can pair up uh, with, with a startup company uh, that has that kind of nimble nature and, and frugality, that kind of brings together the best of both worlds. Fantastic. Any comments? I, I, I also think that that's true. Uh, scalability is one factor, but it, it's, it's moving away from, you know, it's moving into the software realm. Okay, I mean, a lot of this is about how, how, to, how we best use software and how we best use the, the sensors that, that we get from the environment. You know, DSRC or communication with lights and, and it's, in an urban environment is very important. Vehicle to vehicle communications are very important. As those things get better and better, these, these technologies are going to get stronger and stronger. I don't think, I think it's a really exciting time for an auto exec. Um, it is a little nerve wracking because they don't quite know where it's going to go. Um, are they going to sell millions and millions of platforms? I think so. Uh, but it's, they're going to have to be very creative and adaptive and, and, and join the, the movement of these startups which are, which are making the first pu you know, push into these areas. And Claire, yeah, go ahead. I mean, as a startup, we're about and almost three years old now, and I think we've certainly felt the excitement much more than the fear. We have a lot of conversations with really established automakers, and it's amazing to see how open they are, to see how excited they are to, even just to sit down for a coffee and talk about new technology, it's exciting. And so, I, from our side, we definitely feel the excitement much more than the fear. Fantastic. Last word to you, David. Thank you. Um, so Mark Fields was at the CES show and gave a keynote at the Leaders in the Technology Dinner. And he clearly talks about Ford being an auto and a mobility company, right? And so they created Ford Mobility Solutions. And I think Mary Barrett at um, you know, GM and some of the other leaders around the world uh, in this space recognize there's challenges and opportunities and they have to embrace it in order to, to enable and in the last 18 months you've seen all of the collaborations as you pointed out between significant uh, traditional OEMs and startups and and I would say you know there's there's the traditional Detroit or German big three or Japanese big three and then there's these new entrants that are not necessarily startups which is like the Apples and the Googles and the Ubers of the world and then you have these really technology startups that, that all are starting to collaborate. It's really, you know, a couple of years ago it happened with the connected vehicle where you started having the telecoms like Verizon and AT&T collaborate and now you're having this autonomous, you know, Mobileye and Delphi is, are creating a system. So I think you, you have a tremendous amount of, of challenges and opportunities but at the end of the day I think long term mobility is moving away from high speed highway individual mm -hmm. and driven to low-speed, urban, self-driven, electric uh, mobility. And that's going to be the kind of the long-term trend, I think, that we're going to see, not just in the U.S., but globally over the next 10, 15 years. Terrific. So, uh, David, Claire, Andy, Quinn, thank you for your time today. I learned a lot, and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. We're out of time. Thank you, sir. You betcha. <laughs>